All right, reading on in the article, it says this. The basic reason for the constant shortage of labor was that with large amounts of cheap land available, and lot they, it was cheap because they was just taking it and stealing it, man. Everything they found, they was claiming. It says this, and lots of landowners searching for workers, free European immigrants were able to become landowners themselves after a relatively short time, thus increasing the need for workers. See, that's how Esau thinks, because Esau been put into this ruling, ruling class mentality like we like to call it. They got all this land and the first thing they think of is, damn, we need somebody to work on this land. See what I'm saying? We was already over here, as far as the Ten Tribes go, already got the land, but we thinking about just living and taking care of our community, man. Alright, we ain't worried about nobody to come help us work on the land for us. Alright, but that's how the Edomites think. That's how the Europeans think, okay? That's how you uh, Jewish people think. Now, it, said, it says this, Thomas Jefferson attributed the use of slave labor in part to the climate and the consequent idle leisure afforded by slave labor. Now, listen to what it's saying. The consequent idle leisure afforded by slave labor. All right, they just wanted leisure. They didn't want to do no hard work. All right, they wanted to come over here and chill, man, while we did all the work. It says this. For in a warm... This is a quote from Thomas Jefferson now. Great old American forefather. For in a warm climate, no man will labor for himself who can make another labor for him. This is so true that of the proprietors of slaves, a very small proportion indeed are ever seen to labor. All right? Basically, translation, them crackers that came over here didn't do no work. All right? And one of their own said that, Thomas Jefferson, the good old American president. All right? Read on. It says, Africans themselves if themselves played a major role in the slave trade, all right? This ain't talking about us Hebrews, because we're not African. We're not indigenous to that continent, then when they, and we don't need to be identifying ourselves as African either, all right? We are identified as Hebrews and true Jews, all right? So, so, so people can understand we say that we're the Jews. It says this, the Africans that participated in the slave trade sold their captive or prisoners of war to European buyers. Now, who was they, who was they uh, captives or prisoners of war? The Hebrew that they was fighting that came up into Africa. I'm going to read that to you out of Babylon the Timbuktu in a second. It says this, Selling captives or prisoners was common practice among Africans and Arabs during that era. The prisoners and captives that were sold were usually from neighboring or enemy ethnic groups. These captive slaves were not considered as part of the ethnic group or tribe, and kings held no particular loyalty to them. It says this, Most other slaves were obtained from kidnapping or through raids that occurred at gunpoint through joint ventures with Europeans. Some African kings refused to sell any of their captives or criminals. King Jaja of Opobo refused to do business with the slave um, slavers completely. However, Kimani Nahusi notes that with the rise of the large commercial slave trade driven by European needs, enslaving your enemy became less a consequence of war and more and more a reason to go to war. So they, they, the, the, their reasonings, matter of fact, I'm going to go ahead and read this from Babylon to Timbuktu to go ahead and show you that it was blacks living all up in them areas of Africa. All right, first we're going to go back to uh, Babylon to Timbuktu and we're going to go to page 89. It says this, Zael Yemeni came to um came to Kuku about 300 AD an ancient abode of the uh, Songhai tribe he established a line of kings known as the Zaja or Jia dynasty this founder 
of the first Sudanic dynasty in Western Africa was a black Jew. All right, in other words, a Hebrew Israelite. That's a, what a black Jew is. The scripture says this. His name is sometime written, Za'al Ayaman. Joseph J. Williams says that a citizen of Timbuktu named Aber, Abdurrahim or, or Abdurrahman S. Sadi wrote in the book Tarika S. Sudan, History of Sudan, that Za'al Ayaman was derived from uh, Za'men el Yaman which means he has come from Yemen. Za'el Yenemi came to the Niger country by way of uh, Wagala in central Algeria. Wagala was a great trading center of the black Jews. Dr. Barf and Professor Gabe say that Za, the founder of the first Jewish dynasty, established his capital later at Gayo on the upper Niger River. The Arabs, Moors, and Sudan, Sudanic writers attribute to ancient black African Hebrews the establishment of the first empires, the erection of the first public buildings in the country, the construction of the first canals and irrigation systems, and the institution of a social economic regime which still survives in all Saharan communities. See that? So we developed, we were the first to develop all of those things in those areas, all right? The black Hebrews, the black Jews that fled into Africa. And I'm going to read to you how in a very short second. Um, it says this, the black Jews had an advantage over the African tribes. They carried their culture, history, laws, and written records with them. This assured them a constant precedent for the development of a higher social organization. Because of the stability of the black Jewish culture, the Jews were not absorbed into the native tribes. The Jews made use of every opportunity they were an industrious and skillful people in the Jewish uh, Ghanaian states were found kings, princes, governors, Generals, secretaries, treasurers, revenue agents, judges, architects, engineers, doctors, historians, language interpreters, mathematicians, jewelers, sculptors, masons, carpenters, painters of art, goldsmiths, leather workers, potters, armorers, saddlers, blacksmiths, agriculturists, and etc. 